number. <clears throat> and the reasons are actually, with hindsight, kind of obvious. Even the lowest end server you can buy these days. Well, the lowest end server you can buy is probably something from several years ago. The problem with that <laughs> is that it will be, you know, a 10 year old machine might still have enough CPU to maintain a fairly straightforward website. But in the process, it'll be consuming significantly more power, there'll be more air conditioning requires, the economies may actually be poor. But a new server, even the cheapest you can buy, is going to be horrifically over provisioned for straightforward hosting tasks. My own personal server is still a 1 gigahertz Power PC Mac Mini because I haven't got around to the person with anything new and it's in London and so I'm not. Um, that's less convenient. But using the cloud means that we can buy hardware without too much of a concern about the requirements of individual tasks that will be running on this hardware, and then we can just fill that hardware with as many cloud uh, instances as are required to make efficient use of uh, resources. And this is awesome. Uh, in a cloud environment, you will have, on average, a much higher utilization rate of your hardware resources than you would in a traditional hosting environment. And that's environmentally friendly, it's economically effective, and there is no obvious downside. But more than just efficiency, you have the benefits that you're not constrained by the hardware that you personally have bought in advance. And if you have to buy hardware to cope with your worst case scenario, your highest load, which might be for 30 seconds on one day of the year, that's, again, horribly inefficient. You've got hardware you're paying for you've got uh, resources that you use to manufacture this hardware, and most of the time it's completely unused. The 30 seconds you need that hardware are not the same as the 30 seconds that other companies need that hardware. You can end up with a cloud hosting situation where you just have hardware available on demand for cases where you need more resources without having to worry about it spending most of the time idle. And you get to avoid a bunch of hosting complexity. Uh, there's other people who are dealing with your backend storage. You know, if your uh, cloud environment has everything on great back to iSCSI, then there's a bad disk. Your hosting provider swaps that without you ever knowing this has happened. That's wonderful. There's a huge number of very solid, very good reasons to use the cloud for hosting. And I'm sure that most of you who are doing so have actually gained some experience with this work, otherwise you wouldn't be bothering. But obviously there are downsides involved here. In traditional hosting, you know that there is a computer that you're running on. Uh, there are ways that you can even get that computer to tell you exactly what kind of computer it is, which version of the firmware it's running, how it's configured. You could go out and buy an identical computer, and in the comfort and safety of your own home, office, uh, RV, whatever, you could sit there with that computer and you can have an exactly identical environment. And that's interesting. You can do your own resource testing, you can know uh, if there are any cases where this hardware will not do what you want it to do. But nice. In the cloud world, that's not true. You have no idea what the underlying hardware is. Now, for the most part, that won't matter that much, but often you don't even know what's between you and the hardware. If you're hosting on EC2, then you know that you're using Zen. But you don't know what Zen code base Amazon are actually using. Uh, there are, depending on where you're hosting, which EC2 location you're hosting in, there are different versions of Zen, depending on which particular machine you've ended up in on there may be a different version of Zen running to other machines in the same cluster. And you don't know if they've made any local modifications to the source code, because Zen, while GPL, is not technically being distributed to you, and therefore there's no requirement for Amazon to make that available. And they perceive that there's a competitive advantage in making local modifications to Zen and not contributing to the massive community. They'll be fault of them. And you have no idea whether the strange behavior you're seeing might be down to your bug, whether it might be down to a bug in Zen in general, or whether it might be down to a bug in Amazon-specific version of Zen, or whether, even in the worst case, 
in hardware that you're running on has a firmware bug that means under a very small set of circumstances it will overwrite this in memory. Now you might think this is unlikely, but this has happened to me, thankfully on laptops rather than servers, but I've had a very miserable life. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're giving up that transparency, are you perhaps also giving up other fundamental things? The transparency, yeah, it's unless you have a problem, it's not really something you could be that concerned about, except at a kind of philosophical level. But you have no idea what the security implications of that are either. If people have made modifications to the code they're running, how do you know those modifications are good? How do you know that they have to introduce security vulnerabilities? How do you know that they're keeping up to date with their security patching? And you may also be giving up some amount of freedom. If I'm hosting on physical hardware, I can choose exactly the set of software that I deploy to that hardware. In many cases, I can even turn up the data center, get handed the computer, install whatever I want, give the computer back, and have it wrapped and running. But in the cloud, that's no longer the case. I don't get to choose the software that is running underneath my cloud. Yes. The provider gets to choose that. I have no say in the matter, and if I don't like their choices, the only thing I can do is change the hosting provider. And then I'm still limited by what those providers are offering. I don't get complete control. So my background is, uh, well, the long term of my background is in Linux kernel development, especially around system firmware. Uh, but about 18 months ago, I was given an opportunity to move into security development, which is fascinating because people are so bad at it. <laughs> uh, I, I don't, yeah. That's unfair. There are many people who care deeply about security and do it very, very well. And it's wonderful spending time with those people. And by wonderful, I mean I have no faith in our ability to keep computers working at all. <laughs> it's, you, as a kid, you had campfire stories, and you talked about the most horrifying things you could possibly imagine happening to you. And security conferences are like that, except far, far, far worse. Fundamentally, software contains bugs. <laughs> uh, we have discovered a very effective way of producing bugs, and we call it software development. <laughs> and to a first approximation, uh, unless you're very, very careful about this, if you increase the amount of software you have in your system, you increase the number of bugs in your system. <laughs> it's very difficult to increase software lines of code without increasing the number of bugs unless your developers are much better than the average developer. Cloud uh, deployments fundamentally involve more software. <laughs> so you can see where this is going. <laughs> if my hosting job, uh, previously if I had X amount of software running on bare metal, and that was wrecked, in a system, in a hosting center, then I just have maybe, you know, in total, several million lines of code running there. Now, if you put that on top of a hypervisor, and then you put that on top of a large cloud deployment framework and management infrastructure, you're going to increase the number of lines of code by a measurable amount. So, what does that mean? More bugs. Which would be fine if bugs were, you know, content just restricting themselves to occasionally corrupting all your data, or uh, deleting files, or crashing, resulting in downtime. But in fact, bugs are more insidious than that. Bugs tend to result in security issues. Security issues tend to result in loss of sensitive customer data. Loss of sensitive customer data tends to result in lawsuits, which tends to result in uh, Restrictions on your ability to continue as a viable commercial enterprise, <laughs> shall we say. But it's okay. If you go to a cloud provider and you ask them what kind of security they provide, they will tell you, well, it's okay. This is very simple, very straightforward. We have this thing called a hypervisor, and the hypervisor's job is to prevent any of the guests on an instance talking to each other 
or being able to access any of the cloud infrastructure. Therefore, it's completely secure and you don't need to worry about anything. <laughs> that is, a cloud looks kind of like this. Uh, my background before I was in computers was in fruit fly genetics, and I spent a short while before that as a medical student, which didn't work out so well. I have never had any kind of artistic ability at all. So I apologize for this wonderful diagram. But it demonstrates the punch quite well. It's actually really irritating me because I seem to have managed to fail to horizontally center that. <laughs> My apologies for the incompetence. Just move the screen over. <laughs> yeah, but the title is yes. Oh. Uh, never mind. I moved it, but then all the other slides would be broken. So we have a high advisor and we have three guests, and these guests are all happy and blue, just like Jenkins. Uh, so this is a good day. Nothing is going wrong here. The guests are actually <coughs> doing their job and the hypervisor is there preventing any of them from accessing each other other than by explicitly shared resources. And then one day it turns out that the first guest was actually running a PHP bulletin board and credit card sharing forum. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so someone compromised it. But that's fine because the hypervisor is still there. The hypervisor is continuing to prevent access from the guest to any other resources. This is no worse than you having three machines in the same rack and one of the machines is compromised. The others are still all secure. So, yeah. Um, the guest has to communicate with the hypervisor in order to gain access to hardware resources, uh, in, even in hardware virtualization like KVM. The hypervisor still has to play a role in emulating certain resources because the while exit six is now virtualizable, the PC platform as a whole is not. There are certain resources that can only be accessed by the lowest level code on the system and those have to be abstracted and virtualized in order to allow guests to share those resources. Hypervisors are unfortunately made of software. <laughs> And there have been several uh, known vulnerabilities in hypervisors such that this boundary is not as strong as you would hope. There have been cases where it's possible to... Uh, yeah, KPM and QMU had one recently where if you set up more than, I think, 255 network interfaces in one instance, it would get a calculation wrong and overwrite the end of an array, which would potentially allow you to then get our three code executing within QMU, which would then mean that your environment looks kind of like this. Now, unfortunately, when the piece of software you are relying upon to prevent resources from interacting with each other is executing arbitrary code under the control of a hostile actor, you can't actually trust it to perform that one job anymore. <laughs> it's probably still performing the rest of its job's fine, because otherwise that would be inconvenient for the attacker, but you know, if you're relying on this untrusted code to prevent untrusted people from accessing trusted resources, things go kind of badly wrong. Uh, so, fine, you go to your cloud provider and you say, hi, what are you doing in order to ensure that vulnerabilities in hypervisors are fixed? What are you doing to ensure that there are no other vulnerabilities in your cloud infrastructure that an attacker can take advantage of? And, well, this is pretty <laughs> really much as far as you get. Uh, Amazon's entire public documentation on the issue just tells you that there's a hypervisor and you should stop worrying about things. <laughs> Which is... I have opinions on this matter. <laughs> Unfortunately, I am also very aware of this conference's code of conduct. <laughs> it would be inappropriate for me to share them in the way that I would like to. 
Anyway, uh, so ignoring that, I mean, there's not really anyone who will talk to you about this, but partly because it's one of those things where they're worried that, well, if we tell you about what our security model looks like, then an attack will know where our weak spots are. And partly because they're probably not actually doing much about it, and they're hoping that nobody will notice that either. So, the hypervisor is the most obvious part of the attack, especially if you're running a public cloud provider. Now, if you're running a public cloud provider, um, going back here, we assumed that there was a vulnerability that allowed you to get access to one of the guests. If you're running a public cloud provider, there doesn't need to be a vulnerability in any of the guests. I can just upload an already compromised image. The point, the entire point is that you are giving me the ability to run untrusted code in your cloud. That's the service you offer. <laughs> it's your entire business model. So if I'm able to upload untrusted code, what is being done to ensure that the hypervisor is secure? And that's uh, a little bit concerning, because most cloud setups don't actually let you restart the hypervisor without killing all the guests in the process. And that is something that potentially upsets your customers. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to talk about how your cloud service provider has five nines of uptime, but every other week you're going to hard reboot all their instances so you can fix hypervised vulnerabilities. Uh, so options here include hot patching the underlying hypervisor, that is, injecting new code into the running hypervisor modifying it on the fly. For the kernel, there are various pieces of software to do this, like um, K-Patch? K-Splice. K-Splice. I think they're, Red Hat and SUSE both have their own now, as well as the Oracle one, and then there's a fourth from some other company. So you can do that, and you can potentially fix issues that are in the Linux kernel level of the hypervisor. But that doesn't work for the chunks of the code that are in QMU. Uh, QMU, just for background, was originally written as a PC emulator back in the 90s. Uh, it is now able to emulate a bewildering array of different machines, and is also a critical part of the security model in any KVM-based deployment. Just a little bit terrifying, because it wasn't really written with security in mind to begin with. It's, the quality of the uh, QME code is no worse than code in general, but there have been bugs in it, there will continue to be bugs in it, and rewriting it on the fly is not a straightforward thing to do. The alternative is to form live migration, that is, you move the guests off one piece of hardware onto another piece of hardware, and you can do that in a fairly seamless way. Basically, you, um, you copy <coughs> the underlying disk, well, ideally the underlying disk image is shared between the systems anyway, so you just copy the contents of memory over to another machine, you copy the delta between the original storage and the original disk image and the current state of storage over to another machine, and then you start a new instance. You don't actually start it running though. And then you spend the next few seconds repeatedly synchronizing the two of them until the delta gets below a certain level. Then you freeze the first one, copy the last data across, and start the second one. And this ideally results in less than a second of service interruption. You can do that. That means you can migrate all the instances of off one piece of hardware onto another piece of hardware, and then you can reboot the first piece of hardware. This works in general, uh, and by in general I mean in theory. <laughs> in practice, it doesn't always work that well, and there are certain parts of the uh, virtualization model that result in some leakiness that can make this harder. If you move between two systems that have different CPU models, then the set of features, CPU instructions available may change, and that may result in your code was happily running, and then suddenly it gets an illegal instruction error, because it shows its optimizations based on the CPU. It was running on to begin with, there was no way to tell it, oh, by the way, you're running on a completely different CPU now. Problems you didn't really have to worry about in the past. So, the current state of affairs is that it's not easy to fix hypervisor bugs. And so, uh, hypervisor based attacks are something you should probably worry about. 
Anyway, so we have this kind of worst case scenario that the any given virtual machine is only as insecure as the weakest guest on the same machine. Because if there's a hypervisor floor, I can install a guest, lose a guest on that machine, break into the hypervisor, and then break it into another guest. Now, the obvious counter argument to that is well, okay, uh, there's no way to target, in most cases, who you would gain access to. And this, I think, shows um, in some sense a couple of things. First, Attackers don't necessarily care who they're hacking. They will gain access to a system and then check whether it has... <coughs> you gain access to a system, it's very easy to then scan the entirety of RAM. Or even if you're in a hypervisor, you can scan the contents of memory on other guests without even having to go into that guest directly. And that means you could just scan through looking for anything that looks like a private SSL key, anything that looks like a credit card number. And the second thing that people who make this missing is I don't need much money to spin up several thousand tiny instances on Amazon. If each of those ends up on a different piece of bare metal, and I can then scan a bunch of systems from the high or if I can find a way of exploiting that, I'm going to get some interesting material. I don't necessarily care who I get it from, but it'll be interesting and I can probably sell it. But worse than that, it may be possible to go from a single compromised machine, a node in your cloud, and then escalate to further machines in the same cloud. This way, rather than have, so I can export hypervisor, and then from there, I can potentially export the entire cloud. The problem here is uh, uh, the picture that I put here has mysteriously gone missing. That's probably actually convenient because uh, how many of you lived in the UK in the mid 90s? <coughs> yeah, okay. Uh, there was not going to be a single one of you that would get that helpful reference. <laughs> <laughs> so, for the best, really. Anyway, it's a picture of a man in a silly hat holding a large earthenware pot that says armadillos on the side. <laughs> uh, this is a reference to something that ended up becoming known as the armadillo security model, uh, something that is crunchy on the outside and smooth on the inside, like armadillos are. I'm told. I never actually cut an armadillo open. People, yes, not armadillos. It was fine. There was paperwork to say it was all okay. Uh, so this started off as, obviously, I'm really digging myself into a hole here. <laughs> the armadillo security model is one where you assume that the exterior of your network is secure and that nobody's going to get through there. But if something does manage to get through there, you haven't actually put any internal security in place because you assume that there's no way they could compromise your outer boundaries. So if someone is able to gain access to a bare metal device inside your cloud, perhaps through a hypervisor exploit, uh, they're then potentially going to be able to take advantage of this assumption. If the infrastructure that runs your cloud was designed with the mindset that, well, no hostile people can get at it, so we don't need to form any security audits, this is going to result in you having a bad time. <laughs> the components of your cloud are, well, I, I probably don't <laughs> really need to repeat this many more times. They're made of software, software is full of bugs, bugs result in security issues. It's the fact that it's inevitable that there are going to be cases where someone is going to be able to call various APIs within your cloud and perhaps make legitimate use of those APIs to just launch new instances in various places and then at the most straightforward level, if they can use one of these APIs to call them as create new instances, and if they can target those instances to specific pieces of bare metal, then they no longer need to spin up new guests or new hardware in order to perform further compromises. They can just do that through your API instead. They could perhaps even automate it so it launches a piece of uh, an image that immediately breaks into the hypervisor, then shuts off that instance, and then starts searching for interesting personal data. 
or there might be bugs that allow you to execute arbitrary code on the cloud control infrastructure. And if you can achieve that, then you probably also, before too long, have access to credentials for all the customers. You can potentially even inject new SSH keys into running customer instances and gain full shell access to them. And you don't want that to happen. Obviously, this has happened. <laughs> uh, it's not clear that it's happened in the real world. Uh, it is reasonably clear that if it has happened, there would be a lot of incentive to pretend it hadn't. So that's not necessarily a guarantee. It's also possible that this happened and nobody noticed. Or this may be me being overly paranoid. But uh, certainly, OpenStack is wonderful software. It's also written in Python. Python uh, often does not do everything you want it to do, and so there's a temptation to execute existing commands on your system. A lot of the time, you will need to be able to pass arbitrary arguments to these commands. So say the name of a new instance may get passed there, and that might be information that's received from the customer directly, and you just pass that to this command. If you have shell equals true in your Python uh, Open or exec invocations, that entire command line will be interpreted by the shell. That means if someone has, for instance, put semicolon slash bin slash sh semicolon in their instance name, when you spin up that instance, you'll also launch a shell. Now, in that case, that's not particularly useful, but they can also put pipes in there, they can connect it to a network port, and then someone can just connect it into your cloud control infrastructure. Again, that's kind of bad. So, firstly, um, so this, is, this is Python network programming 101. This is, don't do this. The Python documentation says, don't do this. But people do it anyway. I'm not entirely sure why, but it happens a lot. And there have been various bits of OpenStack infrastructure that have had this failure. And when you've got that level of fundamental breakage, you can't assume that the rest of the code is significantly better. The bugs may be less obvious, but they're still almost certainly there. So you can't guarantee that this software is going to be secure. Uh, so obviously you should audit, you should fix bugs, you should update as frequently as possible. But also you should limit access to the bare minimum. There's no reason why a guest, for instance, should be able to call out to any API endpoints directly. That should always be gated through something else. Uh, so firewall off as much of your cloud network from the API endpoints as possible. Make sure they're only accessible for machines that need to be calling them. Require credentials. It should not be possible to do anything particularly interesting without authenticating as someone. But perhaps more importantly, don't share those credentials between different users. Don't share them between different services. Just because I'm authorized to create a new instance does not fundamentally mean that I should be authorized to modify the image storage database. I should not be able to upload new instances having just gained credentials to create a new instance. Sorry, to upload new images. And then keep auditing stuff because uh, people are going to continue writing code and that code is going to provide new features. New features contain new software, it contains new bugs, anyway. There are some other things you should also be worried about. How many of you are familiar with IPMI? I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, so IPMI is a uh, distributed management task force. You can tell that they're enterprise because they wrote a four-letter spec and they've got a four-letter working group name. That's a DMTF. <laughs> Which, finally, after years, I finally managed to disambiguate internally from the DTMF, which is the noises that phone keypads make. Unfortunately, they collision. So the DMTF have this spec, um, Intelligent Platform Management Infrastructure Interface, something like that. It lets you, <coughs> the main thing it lets you do is turn computers on and then turn them off again remotely. So Wonderful for troubleshooting. You no longer need to ask people to turn it on and turn it on again. You can press a button and it happens for them. But that's not sufficient. Uh, there's most vendors will add additional 
infrastructure on top of their IPMI uh, to let you do things like modify firmware configuration to let you have a remote console. So uh, rather than having to plug a keyboard and mouse into the server, you can have a Java app that shows you what it would look like if you just have a keyboard and mouse plugged in there. And you can even get them to boot off, uh, you can upload to the IPMI device a CD image, and you can then have the server boot off that as if it were actually connected to a CD drive. That is, if you have access to the IPMI controller, you can run arbitrary software on the server. Yeah, guess how well written this software is? Very badly. Very badly. Yes, this is very badly written. This software exists as a warning to children to stay out of this industry. <laughs> <laughs> and ideally to, I don't know, take up goat farming. Uh, anything that doesn't involve you having to rely on these people. Next question. Is this the thing that runs on a separate management controller? Yes, this is the thing that runs on a separate management controller. This is, in the past, the management controller tends to be a plug-in card. Uh, vendors have now realized that that's too much effort, and so it's now generally integrated onto the motherboard on a bunch of systems. You can't remove it. I found one where uh, if you logged in, and then if you typed at a command prompt, semicolon slash bin slash sh would give you a root shell on the management console. Because input sanitizing is difficult. <laughs> What's even more fun is the old Dell machines where they had a default password for their admin management that you couldn't change. Yeah, uh, IPMI, the, so the implementations are often bad. The IPMI specification is actually even worse in a bunch of ways because firstly, it uh, states that you must implement a authentication uh, model that doesn't require a password or in fact any other authentication tokens or needs those a username. And IPMI permits you to <coughs> permits vendors to implement non-changeable usernames. And then there's also the problem that IPMI as protocol requires that the devices be willing to hand over the sole attached password without you having to provide any authentication first. Uh, sorry, isn't the assumption that the, that the IPMI controllers will be connected to a separate switch? Yeah, if your IPMI network is not connected to a separate switch, you're doing this very, very wrong. On the other hand, if I have compromised one of your bare metal devices, IBM, for reasons that aren't entirely clear to me, actually have a network link between the management controller and the host machine. So if they have a uh, floor, you can easily get from the machine to the management controller, which then gives you access to that entire management network. Like an internal network link? Network? Yes. Uh, that's good. Crazy. <laughs> And the obvious first thing that an attacker would do if they gain access to one of these things would be to disable the firmware update functionality, so it's not possible for you to get them out of the thing again without either like, taking the machine apart, removing the flash, and reprogramming it by hand, or alternatively, and probably cheaper, throw the server away and buy a new one. <laughs> uh, but also, if you support bare metal hosting, if I'm able to gain access to the bare metal, then I can potentially rewrite the system firmware and I can install a backdoor in system management code and again disable firmware updates such that any future tenants on the same system I can then compromise whenever I want to. I'm not a big fan of public bare metal hosting. <laughs> What is bare metal hosting? Uh, bare metal hosting is when you use cloud infrastructure, but rather than deploy to a virtual machine, you deploy to the actual hardware. Uh, so if you have, uh, if you need lots of resources, then virtualization has some performance overhead. So you will gain some efficiency by using the machine directly without virtualization layer. But that means there's no abstraction between you and the hardware, which means you have direct access to the hardware, which means you can, in a bunch of cases, rewrite low-level stuff on the system, and then that will still be there when anybody else gets access to the same machine. And if the machine is then recycled as, if you don't have a dedicated pool of bare metal things, that might then end up having 20 different VMs run once again, and you potentially get all of it. So by bare metal, you don't mean a physical server you control, it's, it's just a different way of using cloud. It, right, it's, um, 
it's bare metal in the sense that you're running on the hardware rather than on the hypervisor, but it's still under control of the cloud provider rather than under your control. Anyway, <laughs> talk a little bit about freedom the last couple of minutes. Uh, and so yeah, there are certain technical limitations that result in you not having as much control as you want. So if you're an easy to, even at the most basic straightforward level, you're stuck integrating with the hypervisor code that they're using. And that means rather than being able to use an arbitrary bootloader, you're left using pvgrub, which is a fork of the grub legacy code base that was last maintained in, I think, 1876. <laughs> <laughs> and hasn't really got any better since then. Uh, but also, perhaps more importantly, and um, going back to what I was talking about earlier, you don't know what's running behind the scenes. You don't know how stuff ends up on the hardware or what the control infrastructure looks like. Even if people are using OpenStack, OpenStack is not yet capable of deploying itself. There still needs to, OpenStack is capable of controlling itself, but OpenStack is not yet at the point where you can plug a server into a network and have OpenStack automatically install an operating system on that server, install a hypervisor on that server, install OpenStack on that server. There's a project called OpenStack on OpenStack, which uses the existing OpenStack deployment code to run and deploy guests to deploy. Uh, OpenStack is capable of deploying to bare metal to an extent. Using that to then deploy OpenStack is a logical extension of that. There are people working on this, but at this point, the majority of cloud providers are using internal stuff. Uh, you know, people may be using Puppet or Chef or something like that for some of these deployments. You don't know, you have no way of knowing, you have no control over that, you don't know whether there are any behavioral things there that don't interact well with what you want to do. And even if they are using OpenStack, you have no idea whether they've made any local modifications to the code. Uh, Apache does not require that the source code be distributed. And obviously, it's still internal code. Even if you're a customer, they're not giving the code to you. There's no reason, even if it were GPLs, there'd be no reason for them to give you the source code under the terms of the license. So this results in perhaps a uh, false exercise, which is what would an ethical cloud provider look like? And part of that is a fully open security policy. It would be wonderful to see a cloud provider who would provide a full description of their security policies online. And who would provide, in the event of a compromise, a detailed write over of how they follow these procedures, what they found what their conclusions were, and how these procedures should be modified in the future. As an industry, there's not even a well agreed upon set of best practices for cloud security. People aren't really having these conversations. People are doing this internally and not talking to the community about it. But also, a fully free deployment of management stack would be wonderful. Once OpenStack and OpenStack becomes a possibility, then that's going to be very straightforward. But it would be brilliant to have a provider who had a Git repository that contains their internal infrastructure for all of this. If I can check that out, if I can look at it, if I can duplicate it internally and perform my own testing so I have an idea as to whether it's going to fit my needs. As far as I know, there's nobody that even approaches either of these in a convincing way yet. Um, that seems like a failure. On the other hand, even if I can see some of security policy, even if I can see all the code that they're running, I'm still not able to <coughs> deploy modified versions of that code on their cloud, which makes sense. Uh, it seems reasonable that I should not be able to run arbitrary code within somebody else's infrastructure. That could be problematic. But it's still a case where you're forced to choose between convenience and using a public cloud provider or control, um, one where instead, in order to actually be able to exercise all these freedoms, you effectively have to build your own cloud infrastructure and then make modifications to that yourself. And then all I wanted to do was run a local WordPress instance and now I'm a cloud provider. <laughs> Something that hasn't happened to me, but I do occasionally have nightmares of that. Current state of things is pretty bad. There is no way that keeping users in the dark about the kind of security you're providing actually improves their security, but it's done. Anyway, there's no informed choice. I cannot make a rational decision about the behavior of different vendors because 
they won't give me the information I would need to make that choice. I can't choose based on security policy. I can't choose based on the freeness or otherwise of their deployment infrastructure for the most part. And this seems like an easy thing for vendors to compete on. It's something that we should expect vendors to compete on. So, do any of you work for a cloud provider? I should probably have asked that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah. if you have any influence there, then this is a I was going to say keep an easy PR thing, but on the other hand, uh, possibly some people would have to write a security policy before they're able to publish one. <laughs> Great thing about a published security policy is it proves you have a security policy. <laughs> <laughs> and otherwise, we don't know that you do. So, that's everything that I wanted to cover, and um, we've got uh, approximately 90 seconds for questions. Yeah, since you, you're obviously going to be an expert, could you explain what OpenStack is to me and talk slowly on the Django developer? Okay, <laughs> OpenStack is a what is OpenStack? OpenStack is a collection of individual pieces of software that perform management and control of a cloud infrastructure. So there is a component. Uh, for instance, if you have several machines, you need a way to have a central. Uh, access point that allows users to create new instances. And you then need to make a reasonable choice as to which piece of hardware to start that instance on. So you want to look at the resources they requested, you need to find a machine that has those resources available. Given multiple machines with those resources available, you should choose one that allows you to pack stuff as efficiently as possible. So you've got Nova, which is part of OpenStack, which is responsible for that. You've also got a component that is responsible for handling the operating system images, um, allowing people to upload images, allowing people to choose images that are already there, making sure that those images are available on the machine that is about to launch the instance that's going to require that image, that kind of thing. So it that's a collection of tools like that, that's integrates, that provides a management interface so you can log in, you can create your guests, so you can uh, do user management, create users, uh, allocate quotas per user, and so on. And then OpenStack does the now I'll actually make this VM start and give it network access and make sure that it's got an IP address that's routable in the appropriate way, make sure that the firewall rules are modified such that it's possible to access this from the internet if required, firewall off access to port 22 unless the customer explicitly requires it, that kind of thing. Um, it's an open project, it's all Apache 2 license, unfortunately contributing to it requires a contributor license agreement which is a shame. Anyone else? No? Awesome. Well, I think we're out of time, so thank you.